In the story of revolutions, we may like to point to a few big hitters. Russia, China, Spain, Cuba, France. These were all very important events in history, but one very important revolt often goes underlooked by history books. They barely even teach it in schools. It could be described as the first successful working class revolution. I am of course talking about the Paris Commune. Revolutions that came before were historically bourgeois revolutions that replaced monarchies with republics, but 1871 was a different time. It was the revolution of the workers, a huddled mass, not a wealthy landowner. So how did Paris become the melting pot of revolution in 1871? Well to find out we need to go back about 20 years prior. At this time France is under rule by a staunch conservative government. The third Napoleon is getting rave reviews from the peasants and capitalists. He's a bad man, but tough. The workers are fairly demoralised due to their failed revolutions in 1848. And he's also changing the landscape of Paris. Thanks to this man, there's a big building boom, meaning lots and lots of jobs for lots and lots of workers. Not bad seeing as the city has doubled in size in just the past 30 years. Now firstly, France was an industrial country, and Paris was made up of half a million industrial workers, 25% of the entire population. That means lots and lots of people, mostly poor, exploited, alienated, all cramped together in a relatively smaller area when compared with a farm. Add in modern technology and you have a grand space by which to get lots of angry people talking and conspiring. Secondly, they had this thing called the Internationale, which is basically an organisation that helped radical socialists in deciding what they should do, mostly made up at the time by Proudhonists. And a third thing is that Napoleon had to begrudgingly appease the workers because he was becoming increasingly unpopular by the Catholic conservative bourgeoisie as time went on. Turns out invading Italy is not a good thing to do. And so Napoleon grants the workers a few more privileges, but that's a bad thing because, you know, revolution. So what's a better long term way of sustaining power? Something that never fails, ever. A war and he declares war on Prussia. Some excuse to do with Spain, I believe. Bad move. The French were dead from the beginning as the Prussians had vastly superior artillery and military powers. The French army had basically lost by the 2nd of September at the Battle of Sedan. Napoleon surrendered, but Paris established the Second Republic, Nope. built up another army, and they were swiftly defeated. But the workers aren't doing too bad. This comes across as a grand opportunity, and lots of clubs open up with study groups and committees and all that you can think of. Blankvist, Proudhonist, Syndicalist, IWA, they all got really organised here. But uh oh, the Prussians are coming. As the Prussians encircle Paris, supplies weaken. On the 19th of October, a large group of the National Guard, militia groups trained as reserve soldiers who were slowly becoming radicalised to the workers' cause, march on the centre, the Hotel de Ville. We want a new government, they cried, and they were met by a resounding no. And they were like, okay. But then they came again, and this time with an IWA member, and they were much louder this time. But again, no. But then they came back again, and this time they stormed the hotel, and they got really far, and almost set the groundwork for a new government. But again, no. As the siege wears on, the National Guard frees up its membership, allowing anyone to join and elect their own officers. Not bad, eh? No, it's terrible, it's freezing cold, the people are hungry and the Germans are getting bored. But after months of siege, the governments are also kind of getting pretty scared, so eventually they decide to settle a ceasefire with Bismarck and France to cede some territory. But the National Guard, much bigger this time, remains. And they also come back again, but this time there's a lot more fighting and stuff happens. Paris is really pissed off, so now everyone's waiting around for the cradle to blow. The cradle's joints would be unhinged when Bismarck announced that he wanted to come to the centre and do a little victory dance. Chief Executive Adolf Thiers, however, is not amused and is determined to restore order. So how do you restore order in a city on the brink of revolution? You take away their guns is what you do, but for that you're going to need a huge force of men. 20,000 men. So on March 18th, 1871, General Lecomte marched his troops up to Montmartre to secure a selection of cannons that were under guard control, under the cover of darkness. Once they were there, they waited upon some horses to arrive so they could pull them. But Lecomte forgot to bring the harnesses. And by the time daylight had arrived, an angry mob of women had formed. But they didn't engage. I mean, they were outnumbered. Instead, they called upon their fellow Frenchies. Don't defend the state. Come and join the people. Lecomte knew at this point that he was in deep shit and ordered his men to fire upon the crowd. But to his surprise, they said no. Three times no. And with that, many of the army defect, and the guard arrests Lecomte, and they say yes. And when the government heard about this, they ran like hell to Versailles, bringing whatever army they had left along with them. 
And well, there's no central government now, so that means... The workers are in charge of Paris! Well, not entirely, they have to set up a council on March 26th. So now it's Paris 2! Or more appropriately, the Paris Commune! So just so we're all aware here, the first working class revolution was only started by women, but was also a total fluke. So what's going on in this town? Well, there's three main factions, so to speak. The Blankwist believe they should stand as a dictatorship of a few to stand as a change in and of itself away from Republican rule. The Boudonists, on the other hand, believe that it should stand as a movement towards localised municipalism, with France splitting into different communes. And finally, there's the Jacobins. They're basically hipsters who want the 1793 days back. The elected representatives settled on a few things, but most people didn't care. They were just glad they could have a society that they could have better freedom over. Now, before we move on, we should probably talk about this guy. Louis Charles Goulescouze. Louis was formerly a man of Republican leanings, having been imprisoned throughout his life for his revolutionary activities against the monarchy, even having a political holiday on Devil's Island. But Napoleon decides, forget about it, and he comes back home. And when he does, he gets interested in the IWA, and eventually ends up supporting it, which again means he has to flee. But when Napo's army fell, he returned and got straight back to work, and when the commune was erected, he became an honorary delegate. He served many roles whilst in the position, until he landed in the hands of the War Committee. Without any experience what's what were you thinking? So back to Paris. What did this new assembly accomplish? Well, they got rid of the army, job done, replaced it with the guard. Some estates of the rich were readjusted to house the needy and the poor. Religion was considered meh. All council members were paid a maximum wage and were subject to recall whenever necessary. Ideas of a new education system formed around the communards. An original idea of an education that granted every person, regardless of background, gender or ethnicity, the same education, combining both theory and manual work. Instead of there being a divide, as is characterised under capitalism, they transformed factories both abandoned and in use into cooperatives for workers to work at. By the end of May, 43 factories were run democratically. They also transformed the Louvre Museum into a gun factory. I mean, wow. Women got a pretty good deal out of it too. They demanded divorce rights, better education and more participation in the workforce. They even turned churches into discussion centres for their cause. They were vital to the revolution, but they still can't vote. So apart from another siege, this time by the French army, hypocrites, and the Prussians looking on idly by, everything's going pretty well. But there's problems. Not everything's been collectivised. There's still a bourgeois presence and many businesses are still running as normal. And the IWA is mostly made up of mutualists, which at the time didn't have the best tactics. Because the government was allowed to escape to Versailles, they were allowed to regroup. The Parisians didn't care. They were off drinking wine, having a whale of a time, and they wanted to show by example. The problem is bigger army diplomacy doesn't give a shit about your example. And they showed this when they eventually marched on Versailles and figured, nah, it's okay guys, they won't hurt us, they love us. Just put down your arms and they'll be okay. Oh shit. And while we're at it, they kept the central bank rolling. I mean, come on guys, you would have thought that maybe you'd stop the bank loaning money to the outside force while they built up their armies. And Tears did build up his army. And on May 21st, his newly built up peasant force marched into Paris. And thus we begin Bloody Week. The army, led by McMohan, stormed through an unprotected and loyalist section at Pointe du Jour. The army then steamrolled forward, and by the end of the night they had captured all of the 15th borough. Yeah, I'm not using the French word for it. By the 22nd, the battle for Paris had begun. But the boroughs are fairly distinct. Some borgy, some working class. And they don't have complete unity yet. And so du Clouse, well, he didn't really give the guard many orders. He just sort of said, yeah, yeah, you know, do what you want, guys. You know, defend your communities, no biggie. But sadly, an informally trained guard without leadership is no match for an organised and coordinated military. The streets that were once narrow corridors were now large boulevards, and the barricades were cool but fairly useless for the most part. Thanks, Houseman. And they seized more ground. On the 23rd, the army battled it out for Montmartre. And they do, successfully this time, with a little bit of help from the Prussians. And the guard retaliates by BURNING BUILDINGS. A LOT OF THEM. By the 24th, the battle is heading for the east, the Worker's City. But the people are getting weary, and they don't want to fight. Delacluze burns the city hall. Word reaches the guard that the army have been executing prisoners, and so they get their revenge by executing their own prisoners, including the Archbishop. The fifth day arrives, and the battleground has now turned pretty ugly. After capturing the Concord Palace and moving on to the third borough, vicious street fighting occurs, and the leaders run back to the 11th. Delacluze, weary and without hope, stands above the barricades. And in the final few days of fighting, the army took the old Bastille. Soon the army had 19 of the burrows, and with little hope left, the guard made their final stand at the old graveyard. The communards fought hard, but it was no use for Ter's army. On the 28th of May, the commune had fallen, and Paris was secured.
Even though the commune lasted a mere 72 days, much is to be learned from it. It was the first time something like this had ever occurred, and proved to the world that against all odds, a liberated society could be possible, and that the former rulers would stop at nothing to make sure it didn't come to pass. The idea of participatory democracy, whereby people elect their own delegates, not pre-selected by brutes, is one that has permeated all aspects of leftist culture to this day. The tactics and perhaps mistakes that the communards went through heavily influenced important figures from different angles, particularly those of Peter Kropotkin and Vladimir Lenin. When the 1968 unrest broke out in France, people were reported to be marching behind banners and exclaiming, Viva la Commune, in solidarity and remembrance. But the Commune also marked a changing point in European socialism. Bakunin and Marx, the two main factionaries of the Internationale, came to hostilities over how the revolution should have gone about, and this, as well as many other factors, led to the split between the anarchists and Marxists of the Internationale, an effect that still permeates to this day. Bismarck himself proclaimed, Crowned heads, wealth and privilege may well tremble, should ever again the black and red unite. Hey, that's pretty non-sectarian, how about we give that a go, guys? And that, my friends, is the Paris Commune. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching the video, it's taken me a really long time to make, it's really been a bit of a labour of love, and I'd also like to say thank you so much to the people who have been supporting me on Patreon over the past last week, it's just been... I'm overwhelmed by the amount of support, I'll be honest, thank you so much. So, as well as all the people who are going by on this list right here, I'd like to say a special thank you to... Do, 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 a few slices of slightly peppered soft cheese on a bun, a Narka Kiwi, Apothecary Apof, 2, Brandon McIntosh, uh, Brian Killia, uh, Brody Osborne, uh, Corey Glover, David the Benevolent Malevolence, Dan Hernbrot, Def Pigeon, Disciple, Francois René de Chateaubriand, uh, Ilya Lipkiak, uh, Jay de Boos, Jason S, uh, Jeffrey Almonte, cheers Jeffrey, Joe Hart, Jordan Cullen, Joshua W, period, Kira, Laurent Jacques, Jizax, whatever you want to call it, Oliver Thiel, Thiel, Pierre Cormier, uh, Paul is love, Paul is life, Piss Ghost, uh, Sam Caesar, Skylar Relfsteck, uh, Socialism is Unstoppable, Tyler Allen, The Pledger, Unknown Email, Zazizi, and Zubr. Hope you enjoy the terrible green screen. And as well as this, I'd also like to say, Uphold the immortal science of libertarian Leninism. Kate. Bernie Sanders killed Rosa Luxemburg. Gully Foyle is my name, and Terror is my nation. Deep Space is my dwelling place, the stars my destination. And a shout out to the People's Republic of South Yorkshire. That's all for now guys, artwork's in the post, and stay classless.